On Five News, the full horror of the Alton Towers roller coaster crash as new images showing what happened are released. Victims hear the theme park's operator is to blame for their injuries. Also, the search for Ben Needham, 25 years after he disappeared, police start digging on the Greek island of Kos. This is a significant event that we're carrying out over uh, today and the coming days and maybe even weeks. Um, I would not be doing that if I wasn't optimistic. Labour promise a £10 an hour living wage as the Shadow Chancellor makes his big conference speech. And... Can you leave your phone alone? We find out what impact they're having. We should be spending time with me, not your phone. Mm -hmm. I don't go on my phone all the time. It's going to start an argument now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Five News. I'm Sean Williams. The victims of the Alton Towers roller coaster crash, some of them still suffering from the life changing injuries they've endured, sat in court today as the theme park's owners were blamed for what happened. At a sentencing hearing for Merlin, who've already admitted health and safety breaches, the victim's barrister described their disbelief and horror as they saw their carriage was about to collide with another and how they were left trapped on the ride because people on the ground hadn't realised the severity of their injuries. Leila Hayes reports. For Leah Washington, every step is a reminder of what happened to her at Alton Towers last June. Leah, who was 17 at the time, had to have her leg amputated. Her boyfriend, Joe Pugh, suffered shattered kneecaps. Vicky Bolch, who was 19, also lost a leg when the roller coaster crashed. Today, she too came to Stafford Crown Court for the sentencing hearing. All three were in the front row of the Smiler ride at Alton Towers when their carriage crashed into an empty one in front of them. 16 people were injured, five seriously. It took more than four hours to rescue the passengers who were trapped. This CCTV, released for the first time today, shows the empty carriage being sent around the track but failing to complete its journey. After just over two minutes, it comes to a standstill in an area of the track that couldn't be seen by staff operating the ride. The CCTV also shows another carriage containing 16 passengers. The court heard engineers overrode a computer system which they believed had halted the ride in error, sending the full carriage along the track and into the stationary empty carriage. Inside court, prosecutors said the crash was equivalent to a family car colliding at around 90 miles per hour. The court was told passengers on the ride watched in disbelief and horror as they realised they were going to crash into the empty carriage. Chanda Chohan was seriously injured in the crash and says she hopes this hearing will finally lead to the truth. Even up until now, we don't know the full story. We don't know. We just, we've just assumed a lot of things. Um, it'll be fact. We'll be knowing it'll be important because it'll be one more step towards closure. Operator Merlin Attractions has been told to expect a very large fine for breaching health and safety. The court heard there were a number of human errors on the day of the crash, but prosecutors say the fault lies not with individuals but with the employer. And Leila, what more did we hear about the mistakes that were made that day? Well, the court heard that the collision between the two carriages took place at 1.51 that afternoon. Yet the first 999 call wasn't made until 17 minutes later at 8 minutes past 2. We also heard that staff on the ground simply failed to grasp the enormity of the injuries on that train. And we were told that on the day of the crash, there were winds, there were gusts of wind of up to 46 miles per hour. Yet the Smiler ride shouldn't have operated if winds were higher than 34 miles per hour. Well, Merlin have already admitted breaches of health and safety, and they've been told they may receive a fine of up to £10 million. Tomorrow, we will find out what that fine is. Layla, thank you.
For 25 years, Ben Needham's mum has been looking for answers as to why the toddler disappeared on the Greek island of Kos and where he might be now. Today, police began excavation work outside the house where he was last seen alive, following a fresh line of inquiry, suggesting he may have been accidentally knocked over and buried by a mechanical digger. Here's Dominic Reynolds. The biggest of breakthroughs could come from the tiniest fragment. On Kos, the search moves inch by inch. But there's a new hope from British officers here that this patch of Greek ground could finally explain what happened to Ben Needham, the 21-month-old who vanished 25 years ago. This is a significant event that we're carrying out. I would not be doing that if I wasn't optimistic that uh, we're going to find something of significance that hopefully will provide an answer for Ben's family. Ben disappeared in July 1991. He'd been playing outside the house on Kos his family were renovating. But a full search led nowhere. In 2003, police released an image of how he might have looked then. They dug up ground close to where Ben disappeared in 2012, but still no breakthrough. Then earlier this year, with new Home Office money, police appealed again. And new information has brought them back to the place Ben was last seen. It's thought the information centres on this man, Dinos Barkas. A new witness has reportedly told police Barkas may have killed the toddler in an accident with his digger. His widow has dismissed any suggestion he was involved. But the new theory has shocked Ben's mum. Kerry has long believed her son is still alive. Kerry told the Daily Mirror, not even in my worst nightmares has Ben ever been dead until now. I've been waking up and finding my pillow wet with tears. This witness told police we deserve the truth, but we deserve the truth 25 years ago. I spoke to Kerry personally this morning, uh, and clearly it's an extremely upsetting time for all of the family. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but it has been extremely difficult for all of them for the past 25 years. As police diggers began pulling up the ground today, a warning from South Yorkshire police that there will be hundreds of animal bone fragments on this ancient farmland. And if an answer does lie in this soil, it may not be found quickly. Dominic Reynolds, 5 News. A former detective involved in the case of double murder at Christopher Halliwell says he believes he's connected to six other killings. Halliwell was given a whole life sentence last week for the murders of two women in Wiltshire eight years apart. The county's police force says it's speaking to other forces about other possible unsolved cases. The French president, Francois Hollande, says Britain must help deal with the 10,000 people staying at the migrant camp in Calais. He's vowed to close the camp completely, saying the UK has a responsibility to rehouse some of the people there. And police are investigating comments made on Twitter by sacked Coronation Street star Mark Anwar. The actor, who was born in Pakistan, has apologised for his comments about Indian people. Police are investigating the possibility they constituted a hate crime. Labour would raise the national living wage to more than £10 an hour if they were elected. That was one of the key announcements by the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell at the annual conference in Liverpool today as he tried to wrest attention away from the bitter infighting that still plagues the party following the re-election of leader Jeremy Corbyn. From Liverpool, our political editor Andy Bell reports. He is in charge now after a second leadership victory by a bigger margin than a year ago. So now Jeremy Corbyn's team must start fleshing out what they will present to the country. Today, his closest ally, Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell, said he wanted a living wage of £10 an hour as part of Labour's new economic vision. That's our vision to rebuild and transform Britain. In this party, you no longer have to whisper its name. It's called socialism. Solidarity. <laughs> But what about those who aren't signing up to the Corbyn project? The leader of the country's biggest union had this message for them. I now call on Labour MPs to show what they can do from the Commons floor, unite the party and back its leadership so that we can all fight together for this new economy. This MP is one of those who's declared no confidence in her leader. It's not one rule for one, one rule for the other. I support Jeremy Corbyn, I support the Labour Party, I want them to be electable. 
but I will not be silenced through fear and intimidation. So in the way, it's as if there are two conferences going on in Liverpool right now. Here's the official Labour conference by the Mersey. And five minutes down the road, another conference organised by Momentum, the group set up to help Jeremy Corbyn win the leadership. There's no doubt hundreds of thousands have joined up because they like what Jeremy Corbyn is doing. And that may spell trouble for MPs in their constituencies. If they're seen to be sort of working directly against Jeremy Corbyn, you know, especially if they're among the people that are you know, writing articles in the Telegraph and the Mail to, to, to put him down, then, you know, I, I would imagine though when it comes to the re-selection, those local MPs may not have a very good chance. For decades, they were marginal figures. Now they are running things in Labour and the party must get used to it. So, Andy, lots of talk about trying to heal the splits within the Labour Party. Is it that straightforward? No, because we have another row, this time between Jeremy Corbyn and one of his loyalists, Clive Lewis, the defence spokesman, on stage, ready to make a speech about nuclear deterrence, gets a message from Jeremy Corbyn's office asking him to make a change, a change which essentially left the door open to Labour adopting possibly a unilateral policy of nuclear disarmament when it came to the renewal of Trident submarines. Clive Lewis went through with that change, but supposedly he was so annoyed when he came off having delivered his speech that he punched the wall. And one of the criticisms of Jeremy Corbyn's team is not just about ideology, it's about the professionalism and the way he conducts his operations. And that story won't reassure those people who already have concerns about the way Jeremy Corbyn runs the party. Andy, thank you. Andy Bell. Still to come on the programme. The stakes could not be higher. Clinton and Trump tied. Going head to head, America gets ready for the first presidential debate. And not so smart how our addiction to our phones is affecting our lives. I check mine first thing in the morning, middle of the night sometimes. Middle of the night? Yeah, middle of the night sometimes. Why? I don't know. I just, it's a habit now. All that and more after the break. Well, apologies for that. Apologies you didn't get your break and you saw rather more of me than you were expecting. But let's get on with the news. Uh, you're welcome. Welcome back. You're watching Five News. The Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has flown to the border of Turkey and Syria as accusations of war crimes in Syria grow. In the last few minutes, he said it's clear where responsibility lies and it's time Russia stopped its campaign. It's reported that aid is again being delivered to Aleppo, but airstrikes on the city have been relentless, as Simon Weiger reports. Cluster bombs, barrel bombs, incendiary bombs. The US and the UK say this is more evidence of war crimes, and the blame lies with Syria and with Russia. The rebel-held part of Aleppo has been pounded over the weekend, and of course the people who suffer are the civilians caught up in the middle. Now the weapons, and especially since the Russian intervention, uh, uh, a bomb or a missile could turn a, a whole building into a powder. It's like the whole everything would be like uh, demolished. The rebels are still fighting, but it is only on the ground. They do not have air power. Some aid is getting through, but it is patchy and it isn't enough. Another alleged war crime was the bombing of an aid convoy a week ago. Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson is visiting refugee camps in Turkey. He has condemned the Syrian regime and its Russian allies. We all know 
overwhelmingly where responsibility now lies for those deaths. And we can see uh, what is happening. And I hope that the Russians uh, really take account of what is being said, because they are, in my view, uh, in the dock of uh, the court of international public opinion, and they are at risk of being convicted of the most serious crimes. As soon as the Syrian ambassador was called at the United Nations, his counterparts from the United States, the UK and France walked out. There is no trust and Syria believes it will win the war however long it takes. Seasoned observers say Russia holds all the cards. Russia has made major investments in Syria. The reason why Russia has the upper hand, because it's willing to invest. It has a mili major military force. It has fully supported its allies, where the United States and the European powers are unwilling or unable to support the armed rebels. And the, ar the armed rebels are deeply divided. And as the Syrian regime continues to demolish some of its own cities, there is not even a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. Simon Weiger, Five News. He was the gentleman golfer who became the sport's first superstar because of his thrilling gopher broke style. Today, warm tributes have been paid to the man known as the King, Arnold Palmer, who's died at the age of 87. During his long career, he won more than 90 tournaments and had a famous rivalry with Jack Nicklaus in the 1960s. Among those paying tribute, one of today's most high-profile stars. He was such a great man. I mean, he, he, he put on a brave face for, for probably quite a while. I know that he was suffering for a little bit, but um, just, you know, sadness. You know, he meant a lot to a lot of people, and, uh, you know, the, the world and the, the game of golf won't be quite the same without him. Rory McIlroy paying tribute to golfer Arnold Palmer, who's died at the age of 87. It is set to be one of the most fascinating and fiery events of the entire election. Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton live on TV. Tonight, the two rivals go head to head in the first debate of the campaign. And as Charlotte Grant reports, nearly a third of America is predicted to watch. The stakes could not be higher. Clinton and Trump tied. In a presidential debate that could be the most watched ever. As TV audiences go, it doesn't get much bigger than this. With 100 million people expected to tune in, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have a lot to gain and a lot to lose. In round one of three head-to-head -head debates, Trump will be on the left, Clinton on the right. She will get the first question. They both have 90 minutes to convince viewers and voters of their vision for America. But how much do the debates really matter? The candidates need no introduction. We'll just look to losers of the past. In the first ever televised debate, those listening on the radio thought Richard Nixon had it. But his clammy appearance on screen didn't go down well next to a dapper John F. Kennedy. Ronald Reagan proved in 1984 humor can win over voters. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. And this moment when George Bush Sr. was caught checking his watch proved decisive. He lost the election to Bill Clinton in 1992. But this is 2016, where selfies and campaign adverts matter. And Clinton and Trump have already shown very different tactics. I'd look her right in that fat, ugly face of hers. Clinton using Donald Trump's words about women to play to female voters, while Trump portrays Clinton as part of the establishment. Washington insiders remain in control. Journalists speaking to Five News from America say both candidates have to prove themselves in the debate. Donald Trump has to try and copy Hillary Clinton, look like a president, look like he knows what he's talking about. And Hillary Clinton's going to try and have to appeal to the hearts of Americans to show that she's someone that they can empathize with. Rarely have two candidates been uniquely unpopular. So this will be 90 minutes that could change the course of American history. Charlotte Grant, Five News. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have been meeting refugees on the second day of their tour of Canada. At an immigration centre in Vancouver, William and Kate heard from a family who'd fled to the country from Syria. Some of the 30,000 refugees Canada has taken in over the past 11 months. And they also stopped off at a centre for pregnant women who have alcohol and drug problems. There, William was handed a teddy bear by a five-year-old girl that he said would be perfect for their son, George. 
Now, how attached are you to your smartphone? Is it the last thing you look at at night, the first in the morning? Do you ever text while you're talking to a friend or even, heaven forbid, have a sneaky look at your emails at the dinner table? If so, a survey suggests you are not alone. But what is that addiction doing for our health and our relationships? Our health correspondent, Catherine Jones, try to find out. We use them every moment of every day to remind, to record, to buy, to relax and to share. Four out of five UK adults own a smartphone and a new survey now reveals just how much they've become part of life. A quarter of us check our phones less than five minutes before bed. Overnight, one in five check the time and one in ten check messages. Then a third of us check our phone within five minutes of waking. I check mine first thing in the morning, middle of the night sometimes. Middle of the night? Yeah, middle of the night sometimes. Why? I don't know, I just, it's a habit now. I do check it before going to bed, guilty of that. They might do WhatsApp really late, yeah. but we don't see it till the next day. I'm always behind with my WhatsApp. <laughs> the survey also reveals how much we use our phones while in other people's company. More than two thirds of people use a smartphone while having family dinner and four-fifths will use one while talking to friends. But how do you tell if it's actually a problem? You would know you have problem behaviour if you're in a social situation, having dinner, and you feel compelled to use your device. That makes it a problem behaviour. And how we can fix that is we can put in personal boundaries around the use of the technology. Indeed, today's survey found some evidence of that, as a quarter of adults admitted having disagreements with their partner over phone use. Among 25 to 34-year-olds, two out of five have had a row. Yeah, with my girlfriend. She hates it because I use it way too much. My best friend literally has it in her hand all the time, and I'm just like, put your phone away. <laughs> you should be spending time with me, not your phone. I don't go on my phone all the time. It's going to start an argument now. <laughs> <laughs> If you do want to avoid getting too addicted, then the advice is to turn off message alerts and to set yourself some rules, like switching off at mealtimes, with your kids, or in the small hours before your phone tells you to get up. Catherine Jones, 5 News. Our phones are off, promise. Matt's here to tell us what's coming up. Oh. Yours is on. Oh, it's right here. Oh, right. I'm so guilty of that. We're actually <laughs> going to be debating whether smartphones are really taking over our lives at 6.30. We'll also have more on the big debate in America as Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton go head to head. We'll have the latest live from New York as we ask whether Trump really could be the next president of the United States or if they could choose their first female. Thank you very much, Matt. Look forward to that. That's it for now. Sean Welby has the weather next. I'll see you again tomorrow at five. Thanks for watching. Really are going off air now. Bye for now. <laughs>